good afternoon, everybody. Um, thrilled to welcome you all here in what is now our um, several, what is this, our third installment of the Davis School of Business Speaker Series. For some of you, this may be your first um, experience with the Davis School of Business Speaker Series, but what I'll share with you is that this has become uh, a really vital part of what we are doing to elevate the discussion on campus and within the business school. None of that would be possible uh, without two things. Um, one is a guy named Ron Davis, who has made so much happen, not just with the School of Business here, but also with our Guardian Scholars, My Future Pathways, and as a trustee on our board. The other thing that would not be possible without is our students. And before we get started, I just want to get us going on the right foot tonight. Um, I'm going to ask one of our Davis School of Business students to come up and just give a quick flavor of what it's like to be a part of this School of Business. And so with that, I hope you'll welcome, help me welcome Andori. Where are you, Andori? Here he is. Andori, come on up for a moment um, and share, if you would, for a quick second from a student perspective what the Davis School of Business means for you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andori Rutiner. Pleasure to meet you all and see you all. Um, Davis School of Business for me represents opportunity, I would say. Um, I've grown a lot coming here to college. I'm from Peru, so I've seen a lot of things. I've changed countries. I've changed schools. And I will say that being here has been very different than traditional places because here I get the opportunity to actually meet my professor and network correctly. I've had great opportunities such as today where I can meet Mr. Davis in person, where I can hang out with President Marshall himself, where I can communicate with Dr. Baldo, my other professors such as Mr. Sojak. I get a good opportunity to meet face to face, talk in person, and truly shake that hand, make that network, and get feedback on the moment and on the spot. I think that is a key to student success. It's very hard to go into a classroom with 100 people and actually shine. The professor talks for three hours. You just sit there. You just write down notes. What do you get? You really don't get anywhere. But here, I can finish. And if I get a good grade or a bad grade, I can always go out and talk to my professor and learn and, ge and be better. That's where I think this is taking me and what it means to me. So thank you. Thank you, Andor. I think um, we're going to have an opportunity to hear a really thoughtful discussion that uh, Dr. Perry is going to lead tonight with our guest, Mr. Rushmore. And before we do that, um, I want to recognize one of the sponsors that makes tonight possible. The CEO of Vector Bank, Bruce Alexander. I'm going to welcome Bruce up to the stage. Bruce has got a resume that's way too long to read um, because he has a very distinguished career as a banker, as a business person, as a community leader. Uh, he's served as um, on the, the Federal Reserve Board, the Denver Chamber of Commerce. He's been a banker for uh, several decades and, and really just brings a level of commitment to Colorado. And maybe most important on your resume is you're, what, a fifth generation Coloradan? And um, just really grateful for the partnership from Vectra to make tonight and this series possible in partnership with the Davis School of Business. So with that, we are thrilled to welcome you all here tonight. Um, and Bruce, please, um, if you would, come on up and let us say thank you to you. Thank you so much, President Marshall. Um, and thank you all for being here. What an exciting night. We're really looking forward to our speakers and the energy. And I would just say to our student who was up, just up here, whenever you need a job, we got one for you. So <laughs> there'll be all kinds of benefits that come out of tonight for you. But it is so fun to see the energy and the creativity that comes out of an educational environment like this. And to watch CMU over the years, we get to see innovation across the state. We get to see higher education across the state. But what you have done here and what you have done here is just so impressive. The creativity, the innovation, the integrity, uh, it, it's just, it stands out across higher education, across the state of Colorado. So congratulations on what you've done. Thank you so much for what you've done for our state and to see the educational opportunities for the kids here is just great. So I'd like to ask now Matt Burgess, who's our uh, market president here in Grand Junction, really our uh, key driver here of all of our business in the Grand Junction market. So maybe have you make a few words. Thank you. And I want you to know Bruce learned he was going to speak about uh, 30 seconds before this particular event. So thank you for the opportunity. We're really glad to sponsor this uh, series, the speaker series. Uh, thank you 
uh, Carlos for and for Robin for kind of giving us this opportunity to do so. Looking forward, like you guys are, to the interview and, and to learn from a, a real professional who's been in, in business for a long period of time. So with that, thank you so much uh, for being here, and I'll turn this over to Carlos. Well, thanks so much for all of you to attending tonight, all the friends of the community. Uh, one of the feedbacks that we have in the last session it was to involve more community into these events, and that's what we're trying to do. The idea is to keep opening the Davis School of Business to community members and also executives of the region and uh, make this uh, some sort of form of exchange of ideas and opportunities to our students and the members of the community. So again, thanks so much for participating, the students. I hope you enjoy and get a little of that knowledge that we're not able to give you in a classroom that you will get from people that have been in the trenches and know uh, well, many of the real deals, okay? Thanks so much and enjoy this great event. Uh, now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Perry and Mike. This is uh, your time. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. And uh, Mike, thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. So, Mike, I've looked over your resume, and we had a long conversation earlier. Uh, it's a pretty impressive resume. Um, we've got a lot of students in here that are wondering, how do I become successful one day? What should I major in? What should I study? What should I do? You started in engineering, and then you ended up in a Bank of America. You ended up with financial tech. You ended up um, in private equity. Your memory's better than mine. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. So, I hope those are good memories. Yeah. We're going to hear about them here in a second. Um, so the first question I want to ask you as we kind of tell this story is, why did you decide to go into engineering? And then what led to the transition in graduate school to study business? Right. OK. Do you mind if I stand? Oh, I'm please. I'm more comfortable standing. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Makes is it going to be awkward if I sit, mind if I, Do you mind if I stand over you like this? <laughs> it's, it's great. Uh, First of all, thank you for coming today. My wife said, why would anyone come, come and listen to you? So I, I, I found out tonight most of you are being paid. So Ron, this is maybe an expensive night for you, but thank you. Uh, first, thanks to Ron Davis for hosting and for everything that you do in the community, both here and, and back in the valley uh, around Avon. Well, question quickly, is anybody here, um, I heard Guardian Scholars mentioned, is anybody here a Guardian Scholar? Yeah, great, congratulations. Congratulations. How about, oh, uh, there, who is, where is that? Another one? Congratulations. Keep your eye on those two guys. Um, the question was, I think, why yeah, engineering? You, yeah, I, I was thinking, start with your education. Let's hear yeah. for the students okay. why you studied what you studied. Yeah, so public school education uh, up until my mother took a job at a private school as a teacher in Oklahoma. That was an inflection point for me. Oklahoma's 49th out of 50 in funding for public education, so it was good to be able to um, benefit from my mother's generosity as being a school teacher. My dad was a bartender at a strip mall. That was not so constructive for my career, actually. Um, but uh, So I got a private high school education because of my, where my mother taught. I went to college. Um, no one in my neighborhood went to college. None of them. I'm still great friends with half a dozen local friends there, kids that I grew up with, but they didn't go to college. But because of my exposure in high school, I went to university. Um, and I went into the career office. Somebody gave me this advice and looked at the statistics which were published and said, oh, the engineers are the ones that make the most money. So, because I didn't have any money, I thought, that's a good signal. <laughs> that's a theme. Um, I'll tip my hat when it, whenever I'm trying to give you a little advice. So that's a theme. S uh, look for signals in life. There's a signal in the data about salaries, and engineers are really well paid, so that's why engineering. Then another theme is productivity, sort of uh, what's the return on my investment? So then I went to the engineering school, and I said, what are the easiest and what are the hardest disciplines? Well, double almost impossible. Chemical, you're not going to be successful at. Industrial is what you want, because it's sort of engineering, but it, it pays okay, but it's really much easier. So that's how I got to industrial engineering. I like how this guy thinks. I feel like <laughs> we're going to be friends. Um, so probably, probably not, actually. <laughs> so, so you... <laughs> Just kidding. 
So should I stand up? <laughs> um, so you worked three years as an engineer, right? Right. I, and this is another theme, tip the hat. I had to move. So my first job, this was when employers had more leverage than um, employees. This is 1981. I graduated, and uh, Conoco said, we'll give you a job, but we're not going to tell you where it is you, in, unless you accept the job. So I accepted the job, and then they said, the job's in Billings, Montana, which was, is a great place, and I enjoyed. And I was there for three years and then transferred to Houston for a year. At that point, my boss called me, and he said, you just don't seem very happy. I think what he meant was, you don't seem very competent. But he, he used the term happy, which is nice of him, generous. And I said, no, you're right, but I've been accepted to a business school. I'm going to go back to school, so just let me hang out here for another 60 days or something. So I went back to business school because I was not very good as an engineer, and I really didn't like Houston. Um, that was an inflection point. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about on-ramps versus off-ramps. I'm a big fan, if, if, if you're sort of thinking about um, you or a, a sibling or your kid's career, one piece of advice is look for on-ramps. They're going to happen all the time. This is a good example of an on-ramp. On there is an opportunity to meet people, network, find a new opportunity. Look for on-ramps your entire career. They'll happen forever. Um, and uh, business school is an on-ramp. So that's kind of what yeah, We were speaking earlier about the randomness of life and how much of a really successful career is within somebody's control versus kind of s randomness and luck and events. And uh, Mike's a big believer in you can control this, but you have to look for the on-ramps. And that's where that comes from. I think that's right. I, what I saw in my career was, if even if I go back to my um, neighborhood that I grew up in, I mean, these are fabulous people. They didn't have on-ramps that I got because of what I saw when I was in high school, thank you to my mother. And then my peer group, when I was an engineer in the energy industry, almost all those peers stayed in the business, did what they did, and I'd call it sort of a plodding career, and, which is fine. They had probably more balanced family lives. They got to live in the same town for 40 years. That's really valuable. Their kids probably, they you know, saw their kids every night. You know, then there's a different approach, which is to look for these on-ramps and continue to try and push and push and push. And probably because of the circumstances, which I would call humble, Ron's words, thank you again, being generous, humble background. I, um, so, but y y if you accept the sort of trajectory that you're on, and you know, the moving ob just keeps moving along like this, um, then that's one way to go through business life. I felt like I was, had more aspirations. Um, I, I was going to make more sacrifices. And so that involved moving a lot, it involved quitting my job, going back to school, it involved quitting my job later in my career to go do a startup. And so you just have to keep looking for these opportunities and then risk adjusting the opportunities. Are they real or are they bad trades? Because there's a, probably most of them are bad trades, but um, some can be, can be good. So your first on-ramp was Bank of America. And right. you ended up, I, I forget the position, but high up, managing director of Bank of America. Yeah. Um, you didn't start as managing director, though. No, <laughs> no. I asked for that title. Yeah, me, right? Uh, <laughs> I also who wouldn't? Get, I also asked, I honestly did ask to go to work in the mergers and acquisitions department, although I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I, I, I think I read about it. Uh, no, I started as a banking um, associate out of business school. I worked in the oil and gas group because that was my industry background. And here's another takeaway, is I continually look for internal opportunities inside the bank. And, at, and this is sort of like a double se a secret thing that people won't tell you. If you're a banker, don't just tell yours. Um, your boss never wants you to leave. Your boss will always want you to stay, keep doing what you're doing. And your job is to leave. Stop working for that same person. Now, maybe it's 24 months, 36 months, but you got to continue to move because those are those inflection points that you're looking for. That's this. You can climb your career like this in a. You're an economist. What do you call that? Continuous curve. Upward slope. Upward sloping <laughs> continuous. I'm looking for a step function. Is that the right word? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think a step function. 
Th so I, when I was at the bank, I started in oil and gas. I moved quickly to the real estate group, which is a lot more fun than oil and gas. Um, then I went into asset-based lending, which was basically middle market leverage buyouts. Then I moved over and taught the credit trading program, which was really valuable. Then I moved over to capital markets, became, uh, worked on the syndicate desk doing sales for um, big syndicated bank loans. And then I was asked, um, probably the biggest inflection point in my career was I was asked, because I was fairly analytical, to create a research group that looked like a high yield research group on Wall Street, but do it for the global loan market for B of A, which had the biggest market share of um, syndicated bank loans on the planet. So that morphed into a very powerful position, both internally and in the marketplace. A um, couple of anecdotal things. I went from being a so-so salesperson on a syndicate desk, um, let's say I was making X dollars a year, which was a lot at the time because it was in the capital markets. And then within two years, I had a team of, I don't know, a small team, eight or 10 people, but a global footprint. I was in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Barron's, uh, Financial Times. All of a sudden, I had a very public profile because of that, that move, that risky move in, to, to build a research desk. And my salary increased 400% or my comp total compensation, 400%. So <clears throat> that's what I'd call an on-ramp. Tell me more about this salary going up 400% <laughs> and how do I make that happen? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, okay, so you ended as managing director of Bank of America, but then you decided to get entrepreneurial. Right. So tell us about the transition from what sounds like an awesome position yeah, at Bank great. of America yep. to taking risk and starting Loan X. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on this, I'm, I'm running this research function and it's very interesting, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the capital markets at that point in time. This is 1999, is that right? 1999, yeah. Um, and the internet happens. And I looked at, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal every day and I'm writing articles on credit. And I'm reading about this guy, Leo Schlinkert, who's building Bond Hub, which is, using this new technology called the internet to aggregate all research, all capital market research for the buy side across all the sell side. That's cool. And nobody was doing anything like that. And then there was another guy that I met that was creating a new trading exchange for other assets. Um, Non-liquid alternative investments were now moving online. But the biggest alternative capital market on the planet is a syndicated bank loan, $1.3 trillion at that time in new issue. And it was not being traded. And I thought, OK. I took the idea to the bank and said, why don't we do this? And the bank's like, ah, you know, eh. there's a famous saying in innovation. It's like, I'm glad to be invited to the dinner, but I want to make sure I'm not on the menu. And that was sort of Bank of America's fear, is well, we're going to build something that would cannibalize the business. So anyway, I, I left. I raised $8 million from five banks, because we knew it, I mean, I knew it, needed to be an industry platform, not a proprietary bank platform. So built an industry platform. It was awesome. You know, I was named invest, um, Investment Banker of the Month by Investment Dealers Digest. I had big public profile. I had five big banks as partners. It was, the world was my oyster. Exactly zero loans traded on the platform that I built. Zero. I went into the board meeting. It's like, I don't think I used words I would use today. I think I used different words to describe the problem. And the board said, why don't we pivot from liquidity, which is trading, to data, which has a higher valuation multiple anyway. And by the way, if you don't, you're going to have to go back and be the banker again. I didn't want to do that again. Um, and so we pivoted and created a data platform that became something called LoanX. Um, we, we were profitable in two years. Uh, that drew the attention of some other data platforms. I don't know if you guys are involved in finance. There's a, there's a phenomenon that in the cash markets, the funded markets, the growth rate is arith arithmetic. It just goes like this. And in non-cash markets, derivative markets, the growth, race is, growth uh, rate is geometric. So I was in a cash market, a funded bank loan. And, but there was this other guy, Lance, who was, who was building a very similar thing in the derivatives market, and his growth re rate was going to do this. But he also wanted to get scale. So we got together, agreed in 
I'm not kidding, less than 10 minutes to combine the two businesses. We had 60 employees. This is two th January 2004. We merged the two businesses together. And then we went on and did 16 additional acquisitions. Uh, we grew organically. We went from two products to 50 products. We grew from a $60 million market cap to a $4 billion market cap in six years. So that was kind of the, the big uh, inflection point there. So at Bank of America, you were in a leadership role. And yeah. then obviously as a founder, you were in a leadership role. Yeah. So I think this is a good time for me to ask you, what's your leadership style? What lessons in leadership do you have from those two positions? And how, what values did you have as a leader to try and drive this type of performance and growth? At, at did you warn me that on that question? Uh, I, it, I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew I should have read I that. mean, let's do a different question. <laughs> <I'm Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's answer that. What, what is my leadership style? I, you know, people that I've worked um, around and for, I think, uh, and, and that have worked with me might differ. But I, I think I have a, um, I'd say transparency is very important to me. I believe that unlike a corporate environment where you can kind of tiptoe around the truth and still keep your job and still be thought of, well, you know, I wore the right Hermes tie and I wore expensive suits and I, I spoke to the right press and did all those things, that you can do all that and you don't really strive for the truth. I think you sort of strive for your own career. But as an entrepreneur, it's almost the opposite. You don't care about what suit you have on. All you care about is the truth because if you're wrong, you're out of business, so you have to be right. So you, it's just this intense crucible of willingness to debate ideas and conflicting ideas, knowing that you may not have the right answer. But you, you have to have this combination of transparency, um, critical thought. I mean, you can't just, you can't bullshit your way through that because you'll be wrong, and then you're out of business again. And then you have to go, you know, with your tail between your legs back to your investors and say, I'm sorry, I lost your $8 million. So, um, so you have to be, you know, very critical thinking, honest with yourself, transparent. And those people um, that choose to work for you in that environment, that's what they want. So it's, there's a big bright red line between people who are willing to sort of, you know, fight and be honest and be, um, compete, uh, or have, have competitive ideas, and people who you know, want to go to work and make sure they're, you know, they hope they get the, you know, keep their job for the next year or something. And that's not demeaning, because I did that for, you know, 30 years or something. But um, at some point, and almost everybody starts their career doing that, the job, you know, how can I make the most money? How can I get job security? How do I get promoted from banking analyst to banking associate? All those sorts of things that, that people do. But ultimately, later in your career, I didn't become an entre entrepreneur until I was 42 years old. That's really late. But at that point, I had the financial security to do it, and I had the intellectual interest in doing it. Um, so that's uh, so. And I wanted to be in that environment with people who wanted to be innovative and be honest and go f solve a problem. So that's great. So you built this company, you built this idea, and yep. then four years later, market buys yeah. it. So I prefer to say merges. Mer okay. Merges. <laughs> you merged with market. Yes. So what was that like? This has to be your baby. You put your heart and soul into this. It's your idea. I could give a shit about the, <laughs> <laughs> the baby. Okay. This uh, is part of being, I think this is, I mean, this is really important. But m people get wedded to their companies. I think that's crazy. People get wedded to their jobs. I think that's crazy. I mean, this world evolves so quickly and is excel that pace of innovation is accelerating so fast. And I was living, I mean, the internet changed everything, of course. And to, um, to be a successful entrepreneur or business person, whatever, you have to continually look for that on-ramp. The, the merger of Lonex to market was an on-ramp. We went from 20 employees to 60 employees, from one product to two products, from a market cap of 20 million to 60 million. And that, cre more importantly, it consolidated the industry. We became the industry consortium with ultimately 13 investment banks on the platform. Now, every product that an investment bank wanted to outsource 
or every time they wanted to take their little slice of the market, combine it with all the other market data globally, and create a golden copy that they then contributed to, and it's a give-get model, and they get it back, and they can de-risk their own businesses. Um, that platform, that's why we were able to do those, those acquisitions and grow to a $4 billion market cap in six years. Um, I forgot the question, but it seems like a good place for me to pause. Sounds like when I'm lecturing. Um, <laughs> That's what those students said. Forget, forget what they're talking about, you know, and just answer my own question. No, you answered the question perfectly. Um, so uh, I like that answer. I mean, you weren't emotionally attached to this. No, oh, it yeah, was, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, you're good. I, I think being emotionally <laughs> attached is, um, is a tax. I think all it does is it slows you down. It penalizes the people who are looking to you for your leadership. I think your job is to continue to look. And... You know, that platform, I left that, that platform in 2011, and it went on to become a public company, and so further dilute the, the shareholders, which is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, but then used the public currency to merge with a Denver-based company called IHS, scaled up more, much broader product mix, much better for the employees, public company that, it, you know, continued to appreciate in value, and then was sold to Standard & Poor's uh, Global about three or four years ago, I think, at, I think, a $14 billion valuation. Um, but each, yeah, yeah, Ron. Might have a question, but you're an entrepreneur. Talk a little bit about being a social entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. And how gratifying that is. Yeah. Um, well, Ron's a good role model for social, for social entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, don't tell him I said it, but I look up to him a little bit about this. That's a little bit of a role model on this stuff. Um, so I had this 35-year business career or whatever, and I achieved some financial security. I retire. I move to Colorado from London. Um, my kids are off in college, and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do now? You know, I just had left this high-powered job. I had offices in 17 countries, 200 employees uh, on the exec team, do all these things. All of a sudden, I'm, my wife's looking at me, and she said, I married you for better or worse, not for lunch. Leave. So, so we decided uh, we'd each sort of pursue my wife. My wife actually partnered with, with Ron, went to work uh, for Ron in a volunteer role at Guardian Scholars. And I looked around and said, what am I going to do? Um, I talked to some people and they said, you know what, we have real issues in Eagle County where I lived uh, and still live. We have real issues, unmet needs. Um, and we gathered as a, a group of uh, nonprofit leaders, about 100 people, and identified the most critical unmet need at the time was uh, food insecurity, hunger. So um, we had a very small subscale food distribution thing in the county that, that didn't address the need. Eagle County is the second most uh, dire in the state of Colorado in terms of, of hunger. So I just sort of raised my hand and said, that's something, that's a problem I can go solve. I, I tried to solve oil companies needing capital. That wasn't that interesting. I tried to solve uh, tr creating liquidity in the syndicated bank loan market. That didn't work. That was an abysmal failure. We did solve the data problem in credit markets with, with market. And so what's the next problem? Well, the next problem, that's what entrepreneurs look for, is what's the problem? And the problem is, we have people here who don't have enough to eat. And I'll give you, and it's not only sort of, you know, food, traditional food bank sort of stuff that we all know about, but here's an example. And th this, to me, was very motivating, is we, we set up this program and said, we're gonna go solve food, food insecurity in the county. And um, somebody in the office gets a phone call from a mother, and the mother's son was coming home every day with a stamp on his hand because he couldn't afford, for, for, couldn't, could not afford to pay his lunch bill. So the school would give him his lunch, and then they'd stamp as a reminder to his parents that they owed two dollars or whatever the number was. Total, the numbers, I think, if I remember them, there were about 400 kids getting their hands stamped every day, and the total bill was about four thousand dollars. So that's a problem. Right? And so we can solve that problem. Um, and so we did. We solved it. We found out about this on a Friday. Monday, the problem was gone. And every year, no kid in Eagle County gets his head hand stamped any, anymore. We pay for all the student lunches that can't be paid for by the, by the families. Now, what's more rewarding? 
solving the investment bank's problem about portfolio credit concentrations in the syndicated bank loan market on a hung deal for Twitter or feeding people. Pretty simple. So is that fun? Yeah, it's a lot more fun. Um, so today, the Eagle Valley Community Foundation, we started about nine years ago. Uh, we have um, 19 employees, I think. Uh, $2.4 million annual budget. We're highly focused on food security, and we're highly focused on delivering health care to um, vulnerable communities in partnership with Vail Health. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you get, here's another concept for you. This is the tipping the hat thing. You get paid in life a couple different ways. You get paid financially, but you also get paid from your satisfaction that you derive every day when you, when you wake up and you go do something. And money cannot, your high salary and bonus and stock options cannot deliver the same sense of well-being that, uh, that you can get by doing good in the community once you have the capacity to do it. And to be clear, I never would have done it in my 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s. I only did it in my, well, I did it in my late 50s. I'm 65. I did it when I was, you know, 58 or so. Um, so, but I think there's a time in life when that pivot is entirely appropriate. You know, spend your first six decades creating your financial security and then spend whatever time you've got left giving it all away. That, that's, I think, the model in, in, in my family's case. Yes. How do you go about in a small group conversation managing a project and getting the staff that you need to help make it grow question? and it's expand? So How do you go about in like small mountain towns uh, gaining capital and gaining employees that are willing to work for you even if they don't know that if it's going to be successful or not? So are you talking about in a startup environment yeah. like a loan X or a market or a yeah. Black Mountain Systems? Um, Nobody's going to like this answer. So I'm giving you the opportunity to retract the question. <laughs> the, it's not only the financial capital, but it's the intellectual capital. Now, there's a lot of intellectual capital here in Grand Junction. Um, and it, it might be possible here. I will say it's not probably possible in the town where I live um, because you don't have the entrepreneurial horsepower or the brain power or the people who want to do it those people probably i'm using avon those people probably leave avon and they go to san diego or seattle or portland or chicago or new york or london so i think it's a it's a it's a challenge um if i if i uh, let me ask the question a different way if i was going to try to well, no, let me answer it differently. When I was in Chicago, I had 15 years at, at a bank. I had global responsibility. I had lots of resources. I had lots of experience. I had lots of time to prepare to do it. I launched it. I never <clears throat> made any meaningful headway while living in Chicago. I had to go to New York. Now, I didn't move to New York, but I, I got on a plane on Monday morning, and I flew to New York, and I got home on Friday night. Why? That's where the financial capital was, not Chicago. That's where the intellectual capital was, not Chicago. That's where the strategic partnerships were for the data relationships, not Chicago. So it depends what you want to do. It, I mean, I can be socially entrepreneurial in Eagle County. I probably am not going to change the world from Eagle County. So I think you got to match up your aspirations realistically with what your resource pool is in the area. I don't know, Ron. A, a, related, a related question. I spent 10 years with General Foods, okay? Came out of college. Uh, how important do you think it is to, straight out of school, to get good training with a company that can provide you good, good training over and above what you're learning in school, yeah. as opposed to being an entrepreneur at your age? I, I would say it's impossibly, impossible to be an entrepreneur it's your age. I mean, you can open a coffee shop, but 
you're, you're, but, but if I think about me becoming an entrepreneur at a bank and trying and raising capital from J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, and Bank of America, that required me 15 years in the markets and building trust and responsibility. But let me answer your question directly. My first job out of college, I went to a very competitive training program. It lasted a year. About 60% of the people washed out. I barely survived um, until I didn't survive a year later. But uh, that training program was incredibly important. I went back to business school. I graduated from business school. What job did I choose? A, an intense credit training program at Continental Bank in Chicago, 60 people in my class, all MBA graduates. Um, it was just absolutely critical, instrumental. I couldn't have done it any other way. Um, so one of my big takeaways in, is, to, is to look for those training programs um, because those are the institutions that are going to make an investment in you. I don't even know if they exist anymore in, in banking, but when I did it, I mean, we had incredible training. Um, let me just, as a side note here, I, in the uh, packets that are on your bench, um, uh, CMU was kind enough to print off. I reached out, in preparation for this um, session today, I reached out to about 35 or 40 of my friends um, around the world uh, who, who I thought had had big, big successful careers and, and were smart, and I said, what are your one to three best recommendations for this group of primarily CMU students. The first one was from my friend Michael, who runs um, mergers and acquisition for Morgan Stanley. He said, tell them to don't take any advice from old dudes. <laughs> so, but other than that, there's about 65 other recommendations here. And one of them, to answer your question, Ron, is join a training program. If you have any chance to join a training program, um, do it. Audience, do you guys have any questions? I think it's a good time for it, unless there's anything in your career that you want to talk about. I, I do. Thank you, um, Andy Sweet. Uh, I, I Wall come Street from Journal? The, from the Rotary Club. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, thank you, and uh, pardon me for having been late. Please forgive me. Um, I, when I walked in, I, I liked what you said about how that you spend the most productive years of your life I'll just paraphrase that uh, uh, gaining that wealth and then and then the rest of it giving it away, right? So it, so, it sounds a little self-serving now that I hear you say it. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe I say it differently. And, and so, um, if I may, I, I'd read from our objective in Rotary and then and then frame this question. And uh, yep. and that's the objective of Rotary is to encourage and foster the ideal of service as a base of a worthy enterprise, and in particular to encourage and foster first the development of acquaintance as an opportunity for service, second, high ethical standards in business and professions, third, the application of the ideal of service in each of our lives, business community, fourth, the advancement of international understanding, goodwill, and peace through a world, world, a world fellowship of business and professional persons united in the ideal of service. And so then, uh, and, and in this packet I read too, it's uh, some things to avoid, which yep. I like how you touched on ethics, is that, uh, uh, and, and that's what I would like to, you to talk about to to CMU students yeah. who are entering this that that uh, questionable ethics. Um, and so, if you would more sure. talk about that. Yeah. First of all, what what, you, what you've just described the Rotary um, statement there, purpose statement, uh, is incredible. It can't be argued with. It is available at every town in America. And if you move to some place you don't know people yet and you want to be involved in business, I strongly encourage you to join the Rotary. I think it's a great peer group, um, and it's a good grounding in ethics and networking and all the things that you have to have as a condition of success in business. So thanks for bringing that up. Ethics, what's, not, what, you know, what's to be avoided? It's, it's on here. I think the first one was excessive alcohol. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, I've worked with three drunks in my life, and it, you just don't want to do it. Let me just sniff this. I mean, it's a real problem, and, and, and I, I joke about it, and, and, and I drink every day, so I, I'm the right person you want to hear this from, but um, you don't want to be around people who drink excessively, and this is one of those things that's probably controversial, CMU is kind of, I don't know if you should be talking about that, but uh, that's a personal, it's based on my experience. If you find yourself working for someone who's an alcoholic, find a way to get away. That's number one. 
Um, let's see what I have here. Uh, insensitive behavior. Um, you work in a diverse, you're gonna work in a diverse uh, workforce. And um, if you come uh, untrained into that environment, you can sometimes make a mistake, which I did. I'll give you an example. I was a Bank of America. I was running the research function. Um, I, somebody forwarded me a, a, an insensitive joke about a particular population. I forwarded it to a couple of other people uh, using company email. Somebody saw that, reported it to HR. I got a call from HR. I got called in. I, I went and made an apology to the people that I'd forwarded it to. I apologized to my team. And you're going to make mistakes, but you know, just be thoughtful about the, your, your work colleagues. That was number two. Number three was um, bad bosses. Bad bosses exist. If you find yourself working for one, which I have, find a way to get away. They'll keep you down. They won't teach you anything. And one of the, uh, a very consistent theme from my friends, which is much more valuable than what I think, is find, your, find good bosses. So avoid bad bosses, but find good bosses because they're the ones that want you to be successful. They're going to help you be successful, and that's that's ultimately what's going to happen is you're, you're going to have success because your bosses want you to be successful. Then questionable ethics. Um, I honestly never had a serious ethics challenge in my career. I had I tr as I wrote that down, I I wrote some written responses down trying to think back. I did fire some people. F I have fired people for cheating on their travel and entertainment. Um, report. You know, advice to young people. You're going to be given a, a responsibility and the opportunity to cheat and don't do it. Um, don't do it. And I'll give you a very modest example. I was on a call yesterday with a bunch of people and there was some, there was a committee, business committee. We were going through something and it was, there was a question about what could be shared and somebody on the committee said, well, I don't think you should share it, but if you want to like open your computer and then walk by and leave your computer and let that person find it and see it, then that's okay with me. I was like, fuck that. Well, that's ridiculous. There's some ethics. Follow your, follow your moral compass. Um, and, and, you know, it's just that simple. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. What other questions do we have, students? or community members, or anybody. What's your name? What was that? What's your name? Um, I'm Kennedy Petrillo. Oh yeah, Kennedy, we met. Yes. Um, you've talked a lot about finding a good startup when you start. Too much? Talk too much? <laughs> no, not at oh, all. Okay. Um, but it sounds really simple <coughs> when you think about it, but then when you go out and you're searching for jobs, there's salary, benefits, a million different things that go into play on when you're looking for a job. So what do you think is the most important to look for in that first company? Well, I think Ron said it. It's a training program. I, do, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend you go to work for a startup. Um, startups are, are they're fragile. They're probably going to fail. They don't have enough capital. Um, you know, you're just, you, you, for the first, I'd say, five years of your career, you want to be in an institutional environment where there's infrastructure, there's training, there's financial resources, there's professional training on the side, there's job security, there's the opportunity to travel for business, there's smarter people who are much smarter than you, who are, who are used to training people like you, me in that situation as well. So my single, if I had to so say, like, what's the single most valuable piece of advice I could give my younger self, I would say go to work at an institutional quality firm and get in a training program and stay there as long as you feel is appropriate. For some people it's a lifetime, for some people it's 20 years, for some people it's five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brasso. Mike, thanks a lot for all the amazing it's worth what knowledge. you paid for it, which was zero. Yeah, free 99, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question to you is, what do you think is the future of education? You come from a background, you say, yeah. when the internet come in, yeah. now AI is coming in, going to big universities, to small university. What is the future of education from your perspective? Uh, great question. I, I'll give it through my lens. 
Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm informed a little bit by, I, 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 I really believe in podcasts and as a, con a form of continuing education. And one that I listen to very consistently is called uh, The Prof G Show, which is uh, Professor Scott Galloway from NYU. Um, he's a wonderful teacher and he talks about education a lot. And so a lot of my views have developed through listening to Scott, who's an expert and I'm not an expert. But I'll tell you how I learn. I think 40 years ago, you went to, I went to the big state school because I couldn't afford anything else and I couldn't get into any better school and it was fine and it served its purpose. And then three years later, I chose to go back to a business school to further um, build my skill sets and credentialing. We haven't talked about credentialing. Credentialing's really important. Credentialing is getting your CFA, which by the way, if anybody here, you're a business student and, and you graduate and then you think, I want to go to work and for whatever reason, I don't want to go uh, get an MBA or I don't want to further my education that way, get your CFA. It's probably more valuable than your MBA, I, I think. Um, but that's a credentialing of knowledge. So you have to, f the first thing is you have to continue to feed yourself knowledge. The second thing is you want it to be credentialed information. So I'll give you an example of how I use today's education environment. Um, two and a half years ago, I was asked to join a small group of people building an alternative assets portfolio. Well, I've done that on the side for my own account, my, my personal account, but this was for with other people's capital. So I didn't feel like I was the right, uh, prepared to do it. But I had a couple of months to get ready for it. So I Google what are the best online classes on alternative investment. Harvard has a good one. So I spent six weeks um, reading the texts from the, to, to, that were required under the program, take, listening to the lectures online, um, having the peer group of the other students taking the class, and then taking the test, six consecutive tests across different asset classes. And at the end, I felt like I had raised my level of knowledge around that particular thing. And that wasn't possible five years ago, or maybe pre-Coursera or something. But that's, so now I'm really interested in AI. So two days ago, I Google, I was like, what are the AI courses I can study? Well, MIT has a super cool credentialed artificial intelligence class that's exactly what I'm looking for, and I think I'll do that. That's a formal thing. I'll tell you the informal thing. It's Barron's. If, so we're talking about school, business school students. So I had a about an hour before I was sitting here. I read Barron's every week, Wall Street Journal every day, Financial Times every day, The Economist every week. Um, I subscribe to um, Matt Levine from Bloomberg. I get it every day. I subscribe to the Prequin Alternative Investment uh, newsletter, comes out every day. Pitch Book comes out every day. You could study every day, all day long, and it'd be really valuable. So what does the future of higher education look like? I don't know. I'm probably too old to care or influence it, but I do know that the sources of your own personal education are infinite, and I know that if you don't avail yourself to those sources, your competition will. If you brought so and I are competing for the next assignment from the bank around some strategic plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have studied all of those things because they're all available to me. And if you don't, I'm gonna get the assignment. So I'd say um, be willing, recognize, I mean, <laughs> I'm just gonna do a quick exercise here. And this is primarily for the um, undergraduate students. I'm gonna turn to the first article in Barron's, and it's a column called Up and Down Wall Street. I'm gonna read, I'm not gonna read because these are not my reading glasses. <laughs> can you read that first, not the first sentence, but that, can you just read that paragraph out loud? You bet. The benchmark 10-year Treasury note yield briefly breached the 4.5% level this past week, which was widely noted to be the highest level since 2007. That makes it seem as if this were something extraordinary. In actuality, it represented nothing more than a return to normalcy. I'm hooked. <laughs> can, we, can I keep reading? <laughs> yeah. I'm an can. economist. <laughs> now, that article, that, I don't know what that costs, $4 or something today at the Barnes & Noble here in Grand Junction. That paragraph 
we could talk about that paragraph for you could talk about it for weeks. I could talk about it for yeah, an hour. on it, yeah. Right. It's the most important thing happening in the financial markets today. It, I mean, that exact issue came up in my meeting yesterday with someone who said, "We got to buy another company because we can't leave the cash the cash sitting there in a non-earning asset. Cash is not a non-earning asset. It yields four point." 3%, or depending where you want to go on the yield curve, it does more or less. I mean, that first paragraph is basically free to educate you, and there's a thousand more paragraphs in that it, one issue of Barron's, and that comes out every Saturday. If you're a business school student and you are not walking over to the library and pulling up Barron's, and I did it today. I went to the CMU library. I walked in and said, where's the Wall Street Journal? They said, it's online. It's free to all students. It's free. It's a free education. I'm going to stop this, this line of reason, but it's like there is such a massive opportunity to continue your education in whatever access form you want it to be. For me, it's probably 15 daily newsletters, plus the Wall Street Journal, plus the FT, plus the economy, plus Economist, plus um, Barron's. If you're not doing this, I promise you, I'm going to get your job from you if we're competing. Is that forceful enough? I like it. Okay. All right. That's all there. Oh, here we go. From a Guardian Scholar. So uh, when I learn, I learn a lot by emulating. And I grew up sort of in an, in an environment where it's like ask questions if you're confused, but not if you disagree. So I'm, it's sort of touching on those training programs, especially when it's information that I don't understand or know. What are, besides credentials, what are sort of things that you could distinguish a good training program or a good professor, good whatever, between something that's maybe mediocre or subpar? Yeah, good question. I go back to this concept of institution, institutional quality. Um, I mean, the, the training program, the second training pr program I went to in banking, it was, I think there were 60 st people there. They were all from credentialed MBA programs from all over the world, brought to Chicago for two months to go through training. It was obvious it was a good training program. Citibank had a great training program. JP Morgan had a great training program. But it drops off pretty quickly. So probably look for the best company in the industry vertical you're interested in. And that is probably the best training program that's available. Um, yeah, uh, that's what I would do. You know, you want to associate yourself early in your career with the most with the most competent set of people and um, related assets, and that's probably the best. I was speaking with uh, someone, the gentleman in the black hat here, IBM, for a career. No better training program in the world. When I came out of um, grad school, that was a great option. I had lots of friends from undergrad who went to IBM and had very distinguished careers. You know, it's hard to argue with that. So just the best institution you can find. Everybody's thinking, I really want a glass of wine over there. I have a question for you. So in the financial field, in your softball. world. Soft, no, softball? It's, it's one we've talked about. Oh, really? Kind of a softball. Will I remember it? I, yes. OK. So you made a comment when we were speaking earlier about the cutthroat mentality, the competitive attitude you have to have in banking, in yeah. finance. And I've noticed a lot of students, um, and, and it's changed over the you know, 15, 17 years that I've taught. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this generation is taught to be a lot. Uh, they confuse inclusivity and being nice with competitive behavior in the marketplace. And I feel like some of my students don't understand that you have to be competitive if you want to get ahead. And I, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. How do, you, how do you be a good person and have values, but then also go to the marketplace and win? Mm -hmm. um, well, let me, one, one thing that strikes me is it depends. There's a, there, everybody has their own unique desires in life on, on how they want to aspire or achieve and accomplish things. And some people are really focused on family life, for example, or community life, for example. And they can probably find a way to have a very satisfying career in the community that they're in. And they can bake all the kids' softball games. And they can um, 
you know, make all the parent-teacher conferences, and and that's one way to go through through life and have a career, and it's it's absolutely perfectly fine, and it's probably what most people do. I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder, and so I wanted to be more competitive, and so for me, it was a constant battle to try and get to you know find that next on ramp, compete more aggressively. Be, try to be one of the smartest people in the room. I was never going to be the smartest, but be one of the smartest. I could maybe be the most informed person because I was going to read this. And, you know, I, I think you want to continually educate yourself and compete. And you got to match up whatever your personal aspirations are with how to achieve those. So when I ended up fighting for capital from five investment banks and I mean, I could tell you story. I mean, I'll tell you. I, I walked into Deutsche Bank. I'm talking to the the guy Mike, who runs the trading desk. I'm getting ready to raise capital from Deutsche as one of the banks, and he said, "Just to be clear, Mike," he says to me, "I'm I'm going to put you out of business. I'm I'm doing this. We're going to do it on a proprietary basis for Deutsche Bank, and you can go home." And I was like, "Okay, let's let's rumble." Right, I mean that's that's the nature of that conversation. You know, somebody throws it out and you throw it right back in. Um, I can give you here's an example of what happens when you're in a very competitive position. Um, someone I know and close to my wife is um, in a meeting, takes an underwriting position for a big six hundred million dollar transaction. Somebody else on the other side is going to make a different decision to credit and says to her, "If this doesn't go well." Your career is over. Now, that's not a nice thing to do, right? Not a nice thing to say. But that's the reality, right? When you're in a competitive place. So I think you got to find yourself, you know, what are you comfortable with? And your comfort level changes over time. You might be uncomfortable now as a senior at CMU. You're not going to like it if I go up and say, what's the most recent nonfiction book that you've read that you want to recommend? You don't know because you're not reading nonfiction books right now. You're a student. But that's what happens in the real world when you're out in a competitive environment. That if you're meeting with a hedge fund manager talking about it, and he's going to go, well, what are you reading? If you can't tell him what you're reading and surprise him and have some insights, then you don't cut the mustard. That's just a condition of, of being accepted. So it depends. Let me rephrase this. There are, you you got to find out how competitive you want to be and then be prepared to compete based on what your comfort level is. I wanted to be really competitive. Other people, less so. Mike, I think one of the most important things that you're saying is being a lifelong learner. Yeah. You never stop learning because the world is changing. You know, you look at you and I, uh, I mean, the world is absolutely nothing like it was and it's going to change exponentially faster than it did in, in our lifetime. Uh, so being a lifelong learner, I think, is critical. But comment on, on something that you said that I think is related. A good training program, and sometimes it's very hard for, to, to get in with a good company. I went to work for, you know, for General Foods, IBM. But you know, that's one thing. But uh, having a good boss, how important is it in life in seeking out mentors? Um, a couple points here. I think mentors are incredibly important, but I wouldn't say they're more important than your education, your work ethic, your continuous learning process, um, being professional, not making eth ethical mistakes. You know, there's a whole set of, I call them, I think, I, so it's, uh, uh, getting the basics, right? Getting a, a mentor is a basic need. If you don't have one, go find one. Um, it's a basic condition of success, I think. But I'd also say there's five or six other things that are just equally important. Um, so that, that was a mentor. Then there was something else you said that was really, uh, that was it, okay. Carlos. He's telling us we have one minute left. Oh, and he's, giving okay. me the, he's giving me the evil eye. That's what's happening right now. Well, the now. stage is yours. Well, I think we have 30 seconds now, so um, unless there are any other short questions, I think we can, oh. I have, a, I have a question that maybe we can have some other time. So he's a guy that understands debt and having to 
pay things off. If you were in the Federal, Federal Reserve, could you, in five words or less, tell me what our financial debt in the country at $33 billion really means as a, as a Fed banker? It means we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Can I, can I just make some, some final concluding remarks from my Absol perspective? Absolutely. Which is, um, I came from, if you're a CMU student, we probably came from similar backgrounds. I didn't have any money. I went to a state school. I was aspirational. I was competitive. And it doesn't matter one bit where you are today. What matters is what trajectory you put yourself on how fast you climb that flight path, and how long you climb that flight path. That's going to determine your end point. So you're supposed to be aspirational. You're not supposed to settle. You're supposed to be aggressive. You're not supposed to be mild. You're supposed to achieve. You're not supposed to cower. Just have confidence in yourself. And no, you live in a democratic society that lets you do all of those things. If you lived in the other 65% of the world that is not a democratic society, you don't have this option. So I'd actually say you owe it to yourself in a very profound way to be as successful as you can be. Be unique, be aggressive, you know, create, um, network, there is absolutely nothing between you and whatever success you want to have. Zero. And that's only true in the United States. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Thank, again, Ron, for inviting great people to know CMU and the things that we do here. Uh, thanks for our sponsors, uh, once again, helping us in this uh, effort to keep bringing more people into the school of business. Uh, to my colleague, Nate Perry, thanks so much again. He got a chance to open a little bit his agenda to squeeze this event on it. And to the students and the community members for joining us. Now we could pass and have a little bit of refreshment courtesy of our sponsors. Thanks so much.